in this class we are trying to further uh, look at modifications of this that harris corner detector that enables it also to be invariant to be scale changes that's what we are going to have a look at so that's in fact the uh, this is the slide which we were discussing at the end of the last class where assume that you have an object like this when you take this size of window uh, where you are looking at the features of that gradient of i multiplied with gradient of i transpose right the second in other words the second moment matrix you will not see it as a corner point on the other hand if you have a zoomed out version of this image you have an at another image where you want to let's say you are trying to find out a similar image where the same object is there but at a different scale like this and if you are using this window here what you would get now is indeed a corner if you have something in a a, a region of like around this region you would find out a corner here so you could already uh, sense here that as such harris corner detector is not invariant to scale changes right so what do you think you could do in order to bring scale invariance to harris corner detector so that's the question with which i left you in the last class so i would like to see your thoughts about that any even want to make any comments here on how perhaps this can be made or let me even tell the problem a bit more specifically i want you to give this point irrespective of i give you let's say a point around this okay irrespective of i give you this image or if i give you still i want you to give this point so that's what i would like you to give and maybe i'll also show you how the actual harris corner detector would work like so this is what you uh, is the result and uh, repeatability rate i already discussed about uh, this interpretation of this metric in the last class itself you could see here by the time you come to a scaling of 1.5 itself the repeatability rate has fallen from around to around 80% to 30, 20 to 30% which is quite um, uh, quite a drastic drop there right now the question is how can we perhaps modify the harris corner detection algorithm such that it could deal with the scale changes also that's the question um so the corner uh there is corner response function value maybe mm. we can look at the uh, we can set a threshold for the uh, result of the function okay and then after if it crosses the point then you can say we detected a corner successfully yeah else we increase you are uh, almost there except that uh, crossing a threshold there in fact what you would be doing you are pretty close so look at this image for example um uh, see uh, it's in fact what you have to do is first thing you have to clearly mention here is play with the kernel size because a kernel size of this when you are zooming out would be when you look at the image you would realize that that's equivalent to kernel of this size is it not so first thing you are going to do is vary your kernel size over which you are computing some function okay we are not at describing what that function is okay so that's first thing now second thing is the desirable property for this function that you are going to compute over this kernel is such a way that it doesn't depend on the scaling for example something which uh, you know, give you some intuition but is not used in practice as such is not a great metric is average intensity let's say if you are assuming a specific case where that average intensity within that kernel is constant and any change in your kernel would bring it down or something like that okay we will uh, again come back after some time 
and what are in within this class itself what is that function uh, which you could perhaps consider here so for now consider it as a black box function that's constant over the same image region let me put it that way so now what is done here is for example you could see here that if you are looking at that function value and assuming that this function is you could look at it this way you vary is the region size okay for the sake of convenience instead of taking a rectangular boxes here circular regions are taken okay this is uh, you could of course do with circular or you could move to rectangular depending on uh, whichever is more suitable to your context then you compute this function right this is for example on the image one when you are computing this function this is how this function is behaving and let's say what you are interested is this function you assume or uh, you know, this function uh, in fact is expected to reach a maximum value when you look at it when for example it hits a corner that's how your function is designed as i mentioned don't worry about what is that function we'll come back to that little later right now you are notice here you are varying the region size now you take this image 2 which is a this is your image 2 okay which is a zoomed out version of the original one and that also you compute this function right and again there is your what you expect out of this function is that if your image is scaled by a factor of half this would become something like this the same function getting scaled okay just like you had in your signals and systems and dsp a function f of x by 2 something like that okay when you don't sample it similar thing you are expecting here then what you do in the first image you consider so make a note here at each point or each pixel in your image you are not just doing it for one region size but you do it for multiple regions sizes and keep that which has given you the best value you are going to repeat this at each pixel okay and finally pick that which is giving you the maximum value so in this case here you would choose a region size of this whereas here you would choose a region size of this in other words if you want to see the same visualization here you will pick up here this region size and here you will pick up this region size is that clear any questions so far uh, so just one doubt in the yes. next slide you had mentioned how average intensity is uh, like average intensity is scale invariant right so could you explain that ha ah, okay so what i am saying is this is again a very trivial example i have given you so you have let's say some object okay maybe i came here too early okay let's say this region you are expecting that to have average intensity to be constant for that region once you are moving away from that region assume that you are expecting it uh, to vary drastically something like that okay still it's a black box average intensity is not in practice a great measure we will switch from that in no time just is so it is like we are okay so if i am not wrong then we are scaling we are taking it in proportion like right if a circle's radius is this much then the same proportion is taken and that's how the average intensity is right right that's right so, that's right see what i am trying to say all say here is suppose if i if your function is something like sum of intensities if you are taking okay the moment you are increasing the size of your uh, region that's not going to be having a constant value it is going to vary we need such a function which is independent of the size of your region that's all you want so for that i gave you i throwed some example saying that this is an average uh, intensity 
so even if you zoom out now and now let's say the same region is here if you compute here the average intensity is more or less same that's what the assumption here okay so yeah but hmm you got it right okay good any other question or you could think even average intensity within this circle versus average intensity this that some object in a zoomed out version is in this region so average intensity in that region is what you are going to take a look at there any any other questions uh sir so yes. do we measure this uh do we do this process for every pixel that's right that's right okay Th this is computationally more uh, expensive but nothing comes for free hmm you want to get a scale invariance also so you have to do it except that we will figure out uh, how you could uh, do it uh, more computationally efficient but this is something you have to do at every pixel this is what you are going to do for this you take for example s1 image size and s2 image size and uh, uh, still now we have not so this is one example here even for now i will just tell you the name this is called as laplacian of gaussians okay uh, might be you might did you come across this in machine learning course or somewhere this laplacian of gaussians did you ever come across that no sir okay fine we we are going to anyway have a discussion uh, right now after this so for now there is a function okay that function is laplacian of gaussian a black box function for you now you consider this pixel which is not so easy to see there is a church kind of stuff before that there is a house here if i am not wrong and there is a chimney on that so that chimney part if you move anywhere around you would get a a drastic difference in terms of uh, its uh, harris corner function that response function right so that seems to be a good uh, measure here but except that they are at different scales so you will not uh, have that repeatability so you sometimes it would be a good depend the scale plays a vital role here so now you could see here this is a zoomed out version here you could in fact figure out what is the zooming also depending on where it has hit the maximum here okay for the scale if you are looking at you are computing this function at this pixel for all values of different region sizes of your kernel right and this has hit a maximum here and similarly you have done here this has hit a maximum here and then of course you would see if that is above your threshold whatever maximum you got here is that above your threshold of corner response function for that particular scale and if it is so then you would consider this as your key point okay this is the work by lidenberg in 1998 again in the ijcv international journal of computer vision is that clear except the what is that function we will come back to that but other than that the rest should be clear to you so yes, yeah one more doubt uh, how do we distinguish between neighboring pixels if uh, won't we have peaks in very ed close adjacent pixels uh, won't have won't we have peaks uh, in their plots right yeah you again do the same see the rest of the harris corner detection algorithm is in place if you recollect there is a non maximal suppression step also there you still do all those things except that for that particular value you choose this as you also keep track of the scale there whichever scale at that point gives you maximum value you pick that okay but you repeat this to all pixels and the moment you are doing this non maximal suppression on the values that you are getting the surrounding pixels will get dropped down is it not uh, sir but immediately adjacent pixels might still have approximately the same value right that's right see that is why you have this non maximal suppression step if you recollect this will indeed have very close values so let me just display the earlier uh, slide where we were doing it so you would end up with something like this corner functions they are indeed have they are they'll be having very close values but the moment you apply non maximal suppression you will end up with results like this see 
this is exactly same as Harris. The key variation we have done now is you are not fixing the kernel, you are fixing the window for your Gaussian window over which you are integrating the values or whatever in the layer one. Now that window size is variable, one thing. Second, the function you choose for computation here should, should be such a way that it should, depending uh, irrespective of, independent of the size, as long as the object is same, it should give you uh, similar result. These are the only two things that have been modified. So, sir, this scale what we uh, are discussing is only like a zoom in because the, the two yeah, images, right. but not for the zoom out. Right. Zoom that in and zoom out both. The original but, image, zoom out also. Yeah, zoom in and zoom out. Okay, because you vary the scale in both cases, right? From small scale to large scale, that's one thing. But remember, even if there are some rotations of the object happening, we already noticed that Harris Corner detector inherently possesses rotational invariance. So that's, we don't have to do anything extra there. That's already there with the Harris Corner detector itself. Is it not? Yes. And similarly, the same logic holds good for intensity variations also. As long as there is a additive and multiplicative intensity variations, there is no problem. Is it not? So we are only just figured out that this is the key bottleneck for your Harris corner detector is um, the scale invariance. And this is the solution proposed for that purpose. Here, something is mentioned actually 2.5 scale between two images. Uh, yeah, this you could figure out here. That's not very difficult here. On how much scaling is there, you could tell. Let's say you change the region from 2 to 19. You have hit it around 10 here. So the scale of 10 is equivalent to, let's say here you got it at 4. Okay, 4 to 10. So maybe around 2.5, right? Okay. So that's how you could also figure out how much zoom in or zoom out is there in the image by simply looking at where did you hit the peak for that particular pixel. That could, uh, again, maybe one point itself might not be reliable, but when you do it for multiple points and look for an average by getting rid of the outliers, that should give you. Uh, zoom out is there when you look from here to here, or zoom in, and you first, even this is your first image, and that's your second image. Right. Now again, uh, we will follow the similar style of what we did for corner detection properties. What is the desirable properties of this function f that you want to calculate? First thing is this is a very bad sh shape function. If you are calculating it for a given pixel, if the function defined is giving you a graph like this, that means there is no clear maximum here. You might choose this region size, this any of these region sizes, okay? Then this mapping doesn't work anymore. So this is not at all desired. This is a very bad function, okay? Another function is, well, this is not flat, but it has multiple maximas are there or minimas are there. So what would happen then, you, which is more or less similar uh, in the similar range. So it is very hard to say whether this is the right one, this is the right one, or this is the right one. So it could vary. On the contrary, the idealistic scenario is what we have seen the graph here, or it's more like a cartoon version of that, where you have a very clear extrema there. So that tells you now, this is indeed corresponds to that particular size there. Otherwise, you cannot really figure out to what scale they correspond and whether they correspond or not. So this is what is desired. So this is in terms of the properties. So for usual images, a good function would be one 
which responds to contrast so essentially what should happen is once you move from that particular size there should be a significant contrast variations should be there so that's what you use for calculating this function around that this region of your so for example here as that function region size either when it either increases or decreases you would expect if contrast sudden contrast changes are there then if it is capturing that then you would expect that for example this object is there okay somehow you figured it out here and when you are moving away from that you could expect that the object will have a lot of contrast variations even corner that's something we have seen as you move away from that corner you get lot of contrast changes so what do you think could be the kind of functions that could capture contrast changes there is something we have discussed in addition to the derivative first order derivative we looked at some a second order derivative also if you remember and there is something referred to as laplacian of gaussians so first let's take a look at what it means by laplacian laplacian is defined as for example is it is usually denoted by del square f grad del square f or grad square f i don't know how you call it this is defined as do square f by do x square plus do square f by do y square this is how the laplacian is defined as the name says the very very good function very widely used function is laplacian of gaussian so you do a gaussian smoothing on your image and on top of that you apply laplacian this is something which is quite sensitive to this contrast changes second order derivative is there um it just you have already seen that the second order derivative could help you in figuring out the edges there and by the way this is also referred to as another name for it is blob detector this is also referred to as blob detector i will uh, you will be able to appreciate what it means once you understand it in a bit more detail so let me to begin with go through how exactly is the laplacian what, what exactly is the laplacian of gaussian and how you compute that and then let me come back to that uh, why it is referred to as blob detector okay so as i mentioned uh, there are first let us see a laplacian laplacian as i said is del square f okay uh, in the interest of time i am not doing it on a notebook but i am just showing you here again these are few slides as far as laplacian of gaussian is concerned okay i, I snatched uh, stolen some slides from robert collins uh, computer vision course the earlier slides are from rn bobix one these, these are from rn bobix one these uh, referred these are from robert collins one they are nice okay so um, del square f for that to compute it's essentially first look at uh, again let's move to the uh, one dimensional function f of x let's take it okay so i could write for example i what i want to find out is f double dash of x that's what i have to find out so again you consider there is a x plus 1 also you consider here h uh, to be inconsistent with uh, the kind of derivations we did earlier since we have done enough now i am not doing it from scratch but i am rather just showing you uh, the outline here so if i make to a function a small change of plus h here uh, around this x value uh, i changed that and what would be the function value again uh, taylor series comes to our rescue you could write it as f of x plus h times the first order derivative plus h square by 2 factorial which is 
times second order derivative h cube by 3 factorial plus third order derivative and so on now let's do the same for x minus h now okay f of x minus h would be alternative positive and negative that's what you get i'm sure you all know this now you add both okay f of x plus h plus f of x minus h that would give you two times f of x these uh, first order derivative function uh, terms gets cancelled out and here it is h square times f double dash of x now and then uh, these two terms again gets cancelled out and a fourth order terms are there okay you ignore them the fourth order terms and then you could write f double dash of x yes f of x minus h okay mm, i am not sure of this sign okay again there might be few mistakes here in the way he has uh, written here uh, i am not pretty sure i am i am not very sure this is just a loose statement i am making particularly when it is uh comparing uh, the correlation and uh, the uh, uh, the convolution so pay attention for that for yourself so essentially you get here f of yeah okay this is there anyway f of x, this is absolutely fine this is no problem so f double dash x is equal to f of x plus h plus f of x minus h minus 2 times f of x by h square okay now if you make h to be 1 this is nothing but a central difference scheme you are uh, kind of equivalent to that so take h equal to 1 you second order derivative in order to compute that you take you sum the two intensities of your left neighbor and the right neighbor and from that subtract twice the intensity at that point and that would give you do square f by do x square this is 1 minus 2 1 okay this is the in fact this is not a convolution kernel can i call that as a convolution kernel is that is that okay to call it as a convolution kernel no problem with that i guess because this is uh, even if you flip it it would remain same right so there is no problem i i, I take back my statement that uh, this kernel might be wrong uh, this seems right okay 1 minus 2 1 here so this is once you convolve with this for a one dimensional function that would give you the second order derivative of course you could arrive it by doing do by do x of do f by do x okay but except that you have to see where you need to take forward uh, difference where you need to take backward difference then you would arrive at the same thing but this is a more nicer way to arrive at this okay clear so far i'm not doing it uh, on notebook rather i'm just showing it and i leave it to you to work out yourself so that i could save some time and uh, go ahead now that's as far as now we move from uh, second order derivative in 1d to second order derivative equivalent one in 2d and as i mentioned the laplacian is do square f by do x square plus do square f by do y square well if 1 minus 2 1 is this way it gives you the horizontal derivatives okay vertical one would be this thing 1 minus 2 1 and you want to compute here do square f by do x square plus do square f by do y square so you combine both and of course that would give you this mask this being symmetric i can call it as either a convolution or correlation mask doesn't really matter that i have at center minus 4 1 1 1 here right and then of course just if you look at uniform region this is going to be zero so that looks fine the summation of all weights are that and then anyway 1 minus 2 1 plus 1 minus 2 1 in this horizontal and vertical would eventually result in this mask any questions so far on why the uh, this, yes Please just go back to the previous slide to just see the image yeah. for the individual gradients. Yeah. Right? Yes. Right. So is this something similar to like what we did in the previous things, like horizontal gradient for vertical axis and vertical gradient for horizontal? It's almost the same. It's the same thing. See, for example, when you are doing it here, uh, at least this this would be easier to look at. Look at this tower here. Hmm. The tower is visible here because you are doing one minus two minus one vertical tower, right? 
that's not visible there see uh, you look at zero crossing when you are taking second order derivative you look for a maximum or minimum you are doing first order derivative but both would give you the edges that's why we are going for in fact uh, the laplacian yeah okay so yeah Hmm. Yeah, hope that the distinction is clear yeah, right yeah, from here. Yeah. Yes, okay, sir. even yes, you yeah. could see the, for example, this building also, those columns are missing here. Okay, same is this building and other stuff also. Here, for example, is horizontal parts are visible here, which are not so visible here. Okay, good. Um, sir. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, which one is better, sir? Uh, convolving with the two-dimensional kernel or two different one dimensional kernels because we have seen previously that one dimensional kernel is computationally less right. intensive right right uh, yeah you would perhaps do it uh, separately you you might uh, be doing if you are implementing it i guess doing it uh, uh, separately would help you better just that i wanted to tell you uh, well only thing you need to make sure is whether this multiplication of these two is giving you this or not you have to figure out I'm afraid just a simple multiplication of these two won't give you this kernel. You need to check it out. Mm. But you do you you then um, uh, write it as multiplication of a row vector with a column vector. That's the better thing in terms of the computation. Yes, sir. Okay, good. And this is what you get: i x square plus i y square, and then the zero crossings you could get nicely these. edges okay and uh, one more observation you might find interesting is this region is white okay near the i this region where are uh, this tripod you have one region here okay color change is there this is black can you make any comment on why it's becoming so am i clear in my question this region is white here okay this region is black here i would show you a bigger image perhaps if i have okay so at least this should be this is the region where you are getting white and this is the region where you are getting black any thoughts on why is it so um when we compute the second derivative uh, of any function the peaks uh, generally are uh, to detect the peaks if we, to check if it's ma maximum or minimum the value is either negative or positive respectively for maybe i'll give you a hint here just look at this kernel and now make a comment this is what you are doing at a given pixel now you tell me what is happening around this i versus what is happening here uh, around the tripod point all the the remaining intensities are black actually not very good very good that's all see here this is slide this is a, a darker region compared to its pixels around this eye whereas here this exactly the opposite so that's why in this image you are getting like this okay that's anyway just a detail i'll i have not kept much slides here but before that you could already have sensed that this computation uh, is quite expensive do square f by do x square computing that Uh, where you do that uh, by the way uh, you will not so again as i said if you all which you could all we also discussed at the time of discussing about the gradients is that you multiply the derivative operation you are going to do laplacian of image on which a gaussian smoothing is applied right so again you use the associative properties and in fact take the derivative of gaussian and then simply apply that mask to a given image rather than one kernel for smoothing the image followed by one more kernel for computing the laplacian instead of doing that what you do is you find out for the gaussian the laplacian that is why it is called as laplacian of gaussian okay uh, laplacian of it's not gaussian smooth image laplacian of gaussian you do and that's what you apply to the image okay these properties i am skipping now because we discussed that at length mm, i think it's the in the second uh, uh, part of uh, our gradient computation you could refer to that video rather i would now come back here so what you are doing is on the gaussian kernel you take a second order 
derivative and look at this for the time being first focus on this shape uh, which is there in blue is it making sense still let's there again come back to a 1d case so where when i say laplacian for a one dimensional case it's simply d square f by dx square okay now anyway since i kept here one slide here okay again i'm putting it in vertical position and drawing it so it doesn't look very well but hope still you could make some sense here this is what i have this i would leave you to ponder about it you, uh, in fact we have done a first order derivative and second order derivative there you refer to that also but when you take a second order derivative of this gaussian that shape would look like this okay i'm i should not have plotted here because the red and that has a meaning there let me erase that that blue one is what is what you are going to get as a resultant kernel so that's what would happen here so you would be this there is a small peak here on the positive side and then this value would become constant here and then the bigger peak in the opposite direction so that is what see here the relatively some region is there on the side here right and similarly here you would get something like this here and around the center you are going to compute this part you are not in fact going to this is again actually already laying foundations for the next topic to come that is scale invariant uh, feature transform or a descriptor that sift scale invariant feature transform uh, uh, detector um, where instead of using the laplacian directly this would be equivalent to computing a difference of gaussians pay your full attention here what it means there is suppose you take a gaussian which is having a value of stars variance sigma square now you you take another gaussian which is having k times the sigma square value variance value and you subtract from the k times sigma standard deviation the gaussian with a sigma deviation then what you would be getting is the curve shown there in red okay this is the curve you would be getting you could notice there this is almost very close to laplacian of gaussian and in practice for computational purposes this is something because once you do for the whole image you apply one gaussian value another image you apply another gaussian value if the first image you have applied sigma next image you apply let's say two sigma standard deviation you subtract those two images that would give you a result okay which is almost same uh, for all practical purposes both are same as computing the second order derivatives so again um, I, i will uh, in i would have if there are maybe 50 classes i would have asked you to be in an interactive mode to figure out that this is the graph that you would be getting but since we have only close to far not more than 40 classes so i leave it again it would be interesting for you to draw it yourself not on matlab or anything but on a pen and paper you draw it and figure out that let's say this is the first one the red colored one is again i i grabbed it from some wikipedia page i guess so exponential of minus x square by 2 sigma square this normalized it with 1 by sigma 1 and this is exponential of minus x square by 2 times the c2 is Uh, double that c1 i guess okay and if you take that this is which is there in this this is one with high standard deviation okay double maybe and this is the one with other and if you subtract both this is what you would be getting as a resultant which is very close to laplacian of gaussian so in practice you compute the laplacian of gaussian using difference of gaussians
this is something now equivalent to uh, in what steps you want to change your region size here that's what it would correspond to it is like computing a different scale so if you are usually in practice you might change it in sigma to sigma and so on we will come to that part uh, a little later so other than that is that uh, uh, shape of that and the equivalence of uh, laplacian to difference of laplacian of gaussian to difference of gaussian is clear uh, it is clear but it is a huge reduce reduce in computation yes yes that's right that's right that is why uh, this is again another important contribution from the scale invariant uh, feature transform paper by david low which we would come after this uh, civ maybe from the next class itself let me come back now to our scale invariant ha by the way before yeah before moving away from laplacian i want to make couple of more points here first point is it is referred to as blob detector also by that again i would this is not exactly is required at this point but still that would give you a better intuition so this is again uh, let me make use of some slides from a uh, from a whole presentation dedicated to this laplacian of gaussians itself from uh, robert collins and take a few slides there to explain where he talks about why is it like a blob detector see uh, do you remember the template matching stuff that we did while you are doing the gradients where convolving it and getting maximum value or an extrema value is when the correlation is high so where is valdo i'm sure you all remember that when we are discussing that i made a point there that this is in fact a correlation you are doing so you will get a maximum response when this, this is exactly matching with your object of interest right that's how you are, you are taking the valdo picture you are correlating everywhere now the kind of thing you are doing is kind of if i want to put similarities with that you are changing the valdo size as well and then finding out and wherever you get maximum response that is where you have that object present so in a way when you are varying the sigma values and doing it you would get maximum response so look at this function in 2d before going there by the way this is a 1d function we have seen in 2d i think i have that a little earlier or after that only right so the laplacian of gaussian in fact it's a, it's an inverted one it should not be yeah this if you take 2d you just rotate it it is referred to as inverted mexican hat i wish i had a picture here but just imagine this in um, this is okay for me for now you just invert it because that's how it looks like that's uh, while showing that surface it has been perhaps done so this you imagine you rotated this way symmetrically so you get this hat but just flipped hat is what you would get people this kinds of hat if you see a mexican hat okay it will come up slightly up there going down okay and what you get is in fact an inverted mexican hat is what you are getting and and what if you are varying the sigma values you get a maximum response when this size and the edges are contours which are you could see there this is roughly of this shape laplacian of gaussian would be something like this if you look at its uh, uh, intensity profile so when you have something like that profile would keep changing as you are varying as you are varying the standard deviations and that's how this is again a nice, very landmark paper which we would not be going through it where they want to find out for example this part of your the sunflowers so and then you look for this maximum response that is there okay this is again it's not uh, too different from the scale invariant functions so that would if you look at that and put a threshold on that this despite being present at different scales the moment you are looking for a maximum response this laplacians of gaussians would give you this result which is which is very good okay it's a very nice thing it's uh, 
this is that's why this is referred to as blob detector blob is something which is in the shape now this despite being at different scales the moment you are looking for a maximum response this is going to give you that that's why it is referred to as this laplacian of gaussians is also referred to as blob detector maybe in the relevant material i would uh, share this robert collins presentation on laplacians of gaussian also go through it uh, maybe you would get some more insights here and the last point i'm going to mention about this laplacian of gaussians is if you look at it in the frequency domain this is equivalent to a band pass filter this is equivalent to a band pass filter maybe not directly related to what we are doing here but just uh, this is another very interesting property of laplacian of gaussians can you make any guess on why it is uh, yeah, a band pass filter can anyone quickly make an interpretation or inference on why this would be a i'm i'm purposefully showing this slide uh, so that you would be able to infer why this is a band pass filter okay so i leave that question to you and maybe we will continue with that question in the next class okay uh, well so this part maybe uh, i would uh, cover the remaining uh, now we will come back from laplacian of gaussian concepts to how you use it as a function in the scale invariant implementation of harris corner detector i will discuss that in the next class